why is magnesium so important in the diet and how much should we be getting and how do we get it? Right. So one of my favorite topics, I've done a lot of research with magnesium lately. Magnesium is involved in over 600 enzymatic reactions in the body. Um, so everything from muscle function, which includes, of course, your heart, uh, blood pressure regulation, blood uh, sugar regulation, um, all involved with magnesium. And in fact, uh, early on in 2020, uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic uh, came around um, in April, I actually wrote a commentary to Journal of the American College of Nutrition that's been pretty highly cited that argued that COVID-19 um, uh, severity and, uh, and predisposal to catching COVID-19 was a magnesium insufficiency issue in some part. Um, mm. Because if you look at magnesium, it's involved in the regulation of your serum vitamin D levels, which we know low levels are correlated with contracting disease. Um, it's very uh, involved in immune system function uh, and preventing inflammation in the body. Uh, it also is uh, impossible to replete a person in potassium. You know, most critically ill COVID patients had um, hypokalemia. Uh, and so, you cannot replete a person in potassium without first repleting them in magnesium. So all these electrolytes in the body kind of work, work hand in hand, magnesium, calcium, potassium, sodium, um, and others. So again, it's involved in a lot of functions in the body. And in fact, we're studying magnesium right now in uh, competitive cyclists, and we're taking muscle biopsies and looking at the function of the mitochondria uh, with high magnesium supplementation. Now, what's the issue with magnesium? About 50% of the population don't get enough, according to national uh, surveys, which measure you know food intake and calculate nutrient intakes based upon the foods people report. Um, in addition, uh, you know the the recommended intakes for magnesium are over 25 years old. There's a lot of new studies out there. Uh, and I very much advocate that uh, our recommended levels might actually be too low and that the National Academies of Medicine need to reevaluate magnesium uh, in the future because there is some really, really incredible data out there. So magnesium is involved in a lot. Uh, it's a shortfall nutrient in the U.S. population. Uh, it's involved in everything from inflammation to immune function to muscle health and uh, certain uh, aspects of brain health and neurotransmissions. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's one of those things, you know, we see a, a large portion of the population, particularly uh, older adults, um, those that are critically ill, that are hospitalized. Nobody seems to pay attention to magnesium. And it's a really important one to uh, be aware of. Those are terrific points. I honestly, I, I had not heard of it in relation to COVID, the way you described the, 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 the correlation with vitamin D, mm -hmm. um, I had heard, you know, that, 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 that was, that was pretty sure. well established, but the idea, you know, but, but what you said about magnesium makes, makes so much sense. And especially as it relates to vitamin D and everything else. Right. <laughs> you talk, um, go ahead. I was, and if you think about it, where do you get magnesium, dark green, leafy vegetables, nuts and seeds, all those foods that the majority of Americans don't get enough of. Yeah. Right. Well, you mentioned two things that I actually wanted to ask you about. So one of the things is, are there any studies that you are aware of that would look at the population and the prevalence of magnesium deficiency, if you will, in the population? Because that kind of leads, will lead into the second question, which I may as well ask now, is routinely on your yearly physical, magnesium is not something that is, that is drawn. The, the levels of magnesium is not something that is, that is looked at. And if there is a prevalence of deficiency, should that be something, something that, that we should be looking at just, just as a preventative measure rather than trying to chase it when something goes wrong? Right. So here's the issue. Uh, when it comes to clinically looking at magnesium status, uh, the most commonly used marker is serum magnesium. That magnesium is also homeostatically controlled. So the body controls magnesium levels. So just because uh, your serum is at 
normal status doesn't mean that you're adequate. So we're actually looking at different types of markers like whole blood ionized magnesium because there's magnesium in the whole blood, there's ionized magnesium, there's Ooh. serum magnesium, which is bound to protein, but only the ionized can be used in the body. So there's a lot of different markers of magnesium status, but none are really reflective uh, or uh, none are really good markers. So that's why it's not commonly measured. Now, if you're hospitalized and you are you know, in the ICU, it's really likely that you're really, really low in magnesium. So serum levels will show it. But for the average individual that might not be deficient, but they might be what we call insufficient or not getting enough. Uh, and that would, that would cause over time a low grade chronic inflammation, which could lead to some of these, you know, inflammatory related diseases like cancer over a long 20 year period. Um, we don't really have a good way of detecting that. Uh, nutrient intakes from, from food, those are, you know, really under and over-reported depending on the individual. Blood levels, you know, serum or ionized, not really, you know, great status markers. We are kind of arguing that ionized magnesium is a little bit better. And then there comes the issue of what constitutes deficiency. And that depends on which hospital you go to. And we just published a paper last year uh, with some colleagues at the Center for Magnesium Education and Research and uh, a global consortium uh, of scientists in the field from, you know, 20 or so countries that argue that the lower reference interval for magnesium is too low. Um, and we also argue that every hospital uses a different one. And we, we pinpoint what we think uh, should be a, an adequate level. Um, and so really we have no clue what defines deficiency. There was a study in the U.S. Uh, back in the late eighties that basically assessed uh, serum magnesium in a nationally representative sample of U.S. adults. And they basically took the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile and said, if you were under the fifth percentile, that's deficiency. And if you're over it, <laughs> that's you know, huh. that was yeah. your confidence interval right there. So it wasn't based on disease endpoints. Uh, so what we've been doing is looking at individuals with type 2 diabetes, what's their status? Individuals with chronic kidney disease, what's their status? Uh, and trying to see if there's, you know, a biomarker or health-related condition that would be associated with a certain cutoff point so that we could adequately tell who is deficient and who is not. Friends, we hope you're finding value in the content. If you're enjoying what you're watching, please consider hitting the like button, help us with our YouTube algorithm. Consider subscribing to the channel and turn on the notification button to stay up to date with everything going on in the channel. Do you think that, um, that most people could get enough magnesium out of their diet or should people be supplementing with magnesium? And is there a risk, are, are there any um, dangers of taking too much magnesium? Yeah. Um, so. In a perfect world, you know, which in all practicality, you know, I'm sitting here drinking a diet soda, like what you said, as a nutrition scientist in a perfect world, sure, <laughs> magnesium from food, you're eating your nuts and seeds and green vegetables all day. You know, you should be able to get that requirement. Dairy is also a pretty good source uh, of magnesium, but most Americans don't do that, right? You have pizza on Saturday night. You know, you don't necessarily eat all your dark green leafies or incorporate a bunch of nuts into your diet. Um, so most people need a supplement. Um, and that's a really good question because people tend to go on Amazon and purchase the cheap magnesium supplement. I'd say about 90% of the supplements, you know, in the grocery store and maybe even online are magnesium oxide, which is very cheap to create, um, but it's not very well absorbed whatsoever. Um, so there are different magnesium salts, the organic salts and the inorganic salts. Uh, and the organic salts are better absorbed in the body. The exception is magnesium chloride is, is also uh, fairly well absorbed. So mainstream supplements, you know, glycinate, uh, chloride, citrate, uh, those types of magnesium uh, tend to be better absorbed by the body, whereas oxide uh, and some of your other um, more inor uh, or inorganic forms are, are typically uh, not uh, absorbed very well by the body. 
So and the supplement yeah. matters uh, quite substantially. And if, oh, sorry, no, I got you, you got you. Got <laughs> so the um, different salts, the different magnesium salts, uh, I know that there are a number of different recommendations that are floating around that, you know, magnesium is uh, implicated in headaches or lack of magnesium and supplementing can help headaches. Uh, some take it for, for better sleep quality, not spasms. necessarily uh, sp uh, muscle spasms. Yeah. And for sleep quality, which is an interesting concept, not necessarily sleep onset, but actually quality of sleep and sleep staging. And um, the recommendations are of different magnesium salts. And so do you find that, and of course, of course, milk of magnesia is also magnesium, and we know what happens when we take that. Uh, so what, how would you go about recommending, would you separate those based on the specific ailments or specific things that people are looking to, to get out of the magnesium? Or at the end of the day, it's just magnesium, and what's right. the best way to get into your body? Yeah. yeah. Well, again, so you're not really, so toxicity in magnesium we'll call just GI issues. So, um, diarrhea, upset stomach, um, you know, cramping of the stomach, that kind of stuff. That's only really seen with supplements, right? You're not going to get that from eating too many nuts or maybe you will, but it won't be because of the magnesium. <laughs> um, and so the UL or the upper level for magnesium supplements, um, is currently 350 milligrams a day for adults. Now, um, a lot of scientists, including myself think that, that, is that number is not really correct um, and that it needs to be readjusted. And I, I think most adults can tolerate, you know, 500 milligrams or so of uh, magnesium, particularly if it's the non-oxide uh, magnesium. Um, so yeah, you do see some, some side effects with that. I'm sorry, what was your other question? Which of the, which of the salts, if, if does it matter oh. which salt you use, not just organic or inorganic, but I think what you're saying is that uh, different studies have looked at using different salts for different problems. Yeah. And is that right? And, and is that, or no, well, my, my miscarriage? Right. No, 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 absolutely. So, so some rec recommend different salts for different ailments, if you will, or different purposes, you know, sleep, sleep, quality of uh, right. muscle spasms, et cetera. Right. There's not really much um, behind that. So the magnesium salts are either, you know, absorbed or they're not. So mm -hmm. some of them have better absorption than others. Uh, ones like magnesium glycinate claim to be the only ones that cross the blood brain barrier and have effects on migraines and stuff. That's not true. Other forms of magnesium uh, will cross the blood brain barrier, uh, such as magnesium chloride. Um, the uh, Migraine Association does make some pretty bold statements about magnesium supplements for prevention of migraines. And there is substantial data behind that. Um, when it comes to sleep, uh, there's not as much, you know, research there. And, you know, sleep is a little bit more subjective, right? Because uh, you can measure the amount of time people sleep, um, but it's really hard to assess quality of sleep uh, in studies. And there's some new technologies that are improving that. Most of those studies are, are pretty old and pretty subject between uh, person and self-report. Uh, so I, I would say that it's an emerging area of research, but a much stronger data when it comes to migraines. So that, so for, for magnesium, it, it's, it sounds like it's a fair, uh, a fair way to think about it is that if you're, if you're taking supplements, if you, if you aren't feeling GI side effects, you can kind of titrate to GI side effects, um, to get the benefits out of the, the supplement. Is that, is that right? Well, I don't know if I'd say uh, titrate until I, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I missed that a little bit. I mean, um, no. right, the, the, um, uh, this, the, the, the main side effect to, to worry about is with GI side effects. And if you're not having those, then if it's helping you, then you should feel comfortable taking it is what it sounds like. Right. I mean, most people don't need more than, you know, two to 300 milligrams of magnesium, you know, in, a, in supplemental form. Uh, you know, that would just take you beyond the recommended amounts and what would be needed for adequate health. Uh, so and if people, you're talking yeah, 600 people were, milligrams to cause, you know, GI effects. Right. Which, which of the salts, in your opinion, mm. would, you, would you lean more towards in recommending for people to look for? So I usually lean towards uh, citrate and chloride just because uh, they're cheap, they're uh, more available on the market. Uh, glycinate and bisglycinate are also good options. 
Um, they're a little more expensive. They're not necessarily as prevalent. Like if you go into a CVS per se, but they're pretty prevalent on Amazon and, you know, third-party vendors online. So, I mean, the main one to stay away from is Oxide. If you enjoyed that segment and you'd like to watch another, click here. And if you'd like to watch the full episode, click here.